My name is Rosebud Schneider. I am Bear Clan and I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, Manishinaabe. Um, uh, Anishinaabe, um, Apache, Purapecha, and Shawnee. I'm up in Carp Lake, Michigan. I um, am the market manager at Minogan Market. I've been here for about, this is my third winter that I've been up here. Um, we uh, decided to relocate um, back in 2019. Well, I decided to relocate my family. <laughs> they joined along. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have been working in Detroit um, within the Detroit uh, Native community for the last um, 12 years, but really my entire life I've been a part of that community. Um, and one thing that I was taught was to, you know, give back to your community and be, you know, be a part, uh, an active member. Um, and for me, that looked a lot like, um, I worked at American Indian Health and Family Services as a community health worker um, and found my passion with working with um, families specifically around breastfeeding education and health education. Um, and, you know, my kids were uh, super little. My son was six months when I started working there. Um, and we did home visiting with, with you know, families just like myself. Um, and my kids grew up right along with the kids and the families that we were serving. So we learned a lot <laughs> while educating other folks and really, again, like creating um, you know, a community based around just support and love for one another. And um, what came out of all of that was, um, you know, we just started asking questions about what the community wanted. And um, one of the things that, that came out of that was um, we wanted to know how to grow our food. And we wanted to, um, and when I say grow our food, I mean our traditional food that we are, our cultural food that we were, that we didn't have. Um, you know, growing up in Detroit, we don't have access to a ton of stuff. We don't have access to wild rice and we don't have access to seeds and, or even land sometimes. So a lot of us are displaced um, and really trying to figure out our, our place in the world and, and how we fit in and um, <laughs> heal from, you know, generations of trauma. Um, and Again, you know what? You know we did a, an assessment back in 2015. I think it was around then. Um, and folks wanted to know how to, you know, grow our own food and learn these traditional food ways. Um, so we got to work trying to put those things together, and um, I, we were able to um, gain access to, to traditional seeds to, you know, rematriate seeds that that hadn't hadn't been grown out for however long um, we were able to get, you know, kids and families and even, you know, really in an inter intergenerational um, type of collaboration with, with the community in Detroit and bring us all together around these different, these different things. So um, that's, that's how I got my start. Um, one of my most favorite things is being able to cook for our community. Um, you know, I, it's great to be in the kitchen and be by yourself, but really when we come together, especially around these foods, it's because we're coming together to, to celebrate or to be in ceremony with each other. Um, and that to me is like the most powerful and magical thing that happens. Sacred Roots, actually, it's funny, I've got this apron on. That was the name, that's the name of the program. It's our Food Sovereignty Project. Um, and that, yeah, that got started in, I wanna say 2015. Um, and it's still going on. It's still happening. Um, they do a lot of, you know, cooking classes. They they are doing, a, still continuing to, you know, um, take care of the garden space they have in that yard. Um, it's a very small area, so you can't do much, but you can grow out, you know, some, some things. And um, one of the coolest things that I saw happen after I left, you know, the pandemic happened, um, but all these folks that had been, we had all been coming together for, you know, diff different reasons, you know, different, different classes and different projects that we were all doing together. Um, but once the pandemic hit, there, all these, pro all these programs, you know, went away. 
Um, and the folks that were involved in Sacred Roots, they all went off and had their own gardens and were growing seeds that we had outgrown out together. And, you know, they were like putting into practice, like all these things that we had taught them. Um, so that was, and I was like up here so far away from everybody, but it was so great to like see their progress. And I mean, that's the whole point of food sovereignty is building that capacity um, for folks to do that, do that work, you know? And one of my ma most favorite things is being able to create a meal with what I had grown um, and not having, to, not having to go to Meyer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's not always feasible. Um, you know, they don't, I can't grow Flaming Hot Cheetos in my yard <laughs> or ice cream, <laughs> but you know, um, <clears throat> that's always, that's always something I, I, that's always something that I try to like let guide myself, especially around creating meals is what, what do I have, um, rather than creating a meal and then going out and getting out, getting what I, you know, from the store. Um, but my, my main focus um, was our seed rematriation garden. Um, and I, this past year I grew out, I always really like to start off with the three sisters, um, corn, beans, and squash. Traditionally, that's what we've grown for, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, from a nutrition standpoint, when you eat corn, beans, and squash together, that's a full protein. Um, so you don't need necessarily need meat. Um, so that's, some, that's something that I like to keep in mind, like, and again, like when we're planning for, you know, growing season, you're planning for now, for like winter, because that's what you're going to eat, right? Um, so yeah, this year I did, um, corn beans and squash, four different varieties of beans. Um, I've got a couple here. These are the Chippewa beans and these are Odawa beans. Um, I haven't tried these yet, so these, these will go in the soup today. Um, what else did I grow? I did grow out um, a variety from Seed Savers Exchange of a, of a pumpkin. It was just labeled Indian pumpkin. And then it came out, they all, they all ended up looking different, which is very strange. One looked like a watermelon, literally like a watermelon, like that big. And then a couple of them were like just little orange, little weird looking things, gourds. It was strange. Um, but on top of that, I like to add in, I've got perennials out there growing. I have sunchokes growing um, and then some wild strawberries out there. Um, but a, another, you know, instead of uh, a side of the, a, a side of the intentional, like actual seeds that we, that we grow out, um, I really like to get out on the land and forage and gather um, cause there's a lot of wild foods out there that show up for you, um, all throughout the season. So that's, you know, I'm really lucky to be out here cause there's tons of stuff out here that, <laughs> that most people don't know that you can, that you can eat. But, um, that's one of my most favorite things is going into a new space and kind of discovering what's, what's edible. You should always know what's edible around you. <laughs> true yeah <laughs> for sure yeah can you talk a bit about your um your, your garden that you were talking about with the seed savings mm -hmm. or are you going to talk about that later oh i can talk about it now yeah <laughs> yeah sure so um yeah you know my growing experience again goes back you know um to you know my detroit days um and again like I'm not an expert. I'm still learning. Um, but what, what I do know is that, you know, I'm not much different than any other community member that doesn't, you know, doesn't have a lot of access, doesn't have a lot of like knowledge around like growing practices. Um, so one thing I like to show is like how, um, how our, our ancestors grew traditionally and that's growing in, in mounds, right? Um, and that's one of the teachings that I was given. And those are things that I like to, I like to carry on and, and show other folks, especially our young ones, um, you know, making those mounds together, um, getting the, you know, prepping the land, 
um, and then coming together as a community with these seeds. And then, you know, every season we've done a, a, a planting ceremony where we come out and do, you know, actually be out in the in the garden and say our prayers and sing some seed songs. And then we all take turns, um, you know, planting in the mounds together. And, you know, again, like that's, that's not one person's job. It's everybody's job. If we were a village, we would all be out there planting together. Um, and it's, you know, quick work when it's 20 of us <laughs> dropping a few seeds and, you know, a two acre plot of land. But, um, you know, so we, we do that. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, again, it's like, a, it's a progress. We, we wait a month. Um, and then we bring everybody back out again and we plant our beans and our squash. Um, and then we get to see like how, how big the corn has grown. And, you know, t I like to teach all the, especially my kids and all the young ones, like to talk to your plants and have good feelings when you're out there. And, um, you know, cause everything has its purpose and we all should be respecting all living things. Cause you know, they're, if we take care of them, they're going to take care of us. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's that part. And then, um, again, I, you know, I talked a little about, about perennials, but I, you know, that's a huge, huge, huge part of what I've been trying to do out there since I've been here is, um, design a place where folks can just go in and hang and find, you know, <laughs> find, find, find their medicinal plants and find perennials and, you know, gather what they're, what they're looking for. So in that small little space that we have, um, we have its own little ecosystem. So when we talk about decolonizing our diet, decolonizing our diet, the actual term comes from um, Marty Reinhardt, who is a um, powerhouse in the Anishinaabe community, um, but that was his project. And basically what it comes down to is um, going back to our pre-colonial diet, what our ancestors ate before contact. Um, and what that, that means is just what was here, what was indigenous to North America. Um, so again, corn, bean, squash, um, every nation has its their own, um, variety that they were growing. Wild rice is a huge part of, of our diet, especially in Anishinaabe people. Um, it is part of one of our prophecies. Um, Anishinaabe people were originally, um, on the East coast. And one of their prophecies told them to keep moving westward until they found uh, food that grew on the water. And that was wild rice. So then they, they re relocated to the Great Lakes area and we're, we're still here to this day. Um, yeah, I mean, tomatoes are North American, indigenous to North America. Um, and we talk about sun chokes. Sun chokes is also, let me rewind a little bit. So we have the three sisters, um, but some nations talk about the seven sisters. And that's the, you know, corn beans and squash, but also sunflowers, sun chokes, strawberries, and tobacco or sweet grass, depending on where you're from. <laughs> it's interchangeable. Um, but tomatoes, where are, you know, indigenous to, to, you know, South America and even like Southern North America. Um, one thing that I learned not that long ago was, um, which I thought was so cool and it stayed with me that there is a Dakota word for seaweed. And so that means, I mean, they're, those are landlocked people. They were not by the water at all, but that tells me that they were getting around <laughs> trading with from nation to nation. And I think that that is so cool <laughs> that we would, you know, um, if there would, hadn't have been contact, there still would have been so much innovation happening, you know, with indigenous people here. So it's interesting to think about like that, <laughs> think that um, what would have been and you know, what we would have figured out, <laughs> but we had been, you know, we're, we had been thriving for, you know, eons and eons. So my decision to move up here was a 
tough decision. That's for sure. Um, I was really, really looking for a different kind of experience. Um, you know, the Detroit farming community is amazing. It's really hard to farm in Detroit, <laughs> um, especially when you don't have your own land. And I'm sure every Detroit farmer can agree with me, the struggles that come along with that um, and that come along with caring for, for our land, right? Um, so, you know, the, the indigenous food sovereignty community is quite large, but very close knit. Um, and through my time with Sacred Roots, we did a lot of traveling and attending other, you know, uh, food sovereignty events and visiting communities. And um, in 2017, I uh, was attending the Organic Farmers Training Program at MSU. And we just so happened to be up here for another work thing, um, my coworker and I. Um, and we decided, well, there, there's a farm, there's a tribal farm up there, we should go visit, because that was one of our favorite things to do, is go visit different farms just to see, you know, what they were doing. Um, so I came here, visited, um, met with a couple, with one of the farmers here and a couple of the board members, and I like instantly fell in love with this land. And something like, something happened. <laughs> um, and I loved it. And I like had this, I'm like, I could, I could, we could relocate. I could be a farmer. It could be fine. It's fine. We could do that. Um, you know, my family had a different thought about it. Like, are you crazy? What is wrong with you? Why can't you just have a normal like job? <laughs> um, but I felt really strongly about, again, this experience and, and growing food and feeding people. Um, and, uh, one thing kind of happened, you know, one thing led to the other, lots of conversations between that. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to relocate an entire family. We made the leap in um, 2019. I had no idea what to expect. I thought, I don't, I don't know what I thought. Um, all I knew is that I was ready to just like jump in and like do the most, see, you know, see what would happen. Um, and I think, you know, the last three, three seasons have been great. Um, but a huge learning, learning experience for sure. I mean, it's not, this is not easy work <laughs> at all. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like worn out, <laughs> whether I'm out in the, on the farm or at the store. I mean, it's hard work, but, um, I love what I do. I love, I love my job. I've loved my job the last, you know, 15 years, I love the things that I've been able to do. So um, I'm really grateful for that because not very many people can say that they like love their job. There's days where moments where I'm like, okay, this is awful, but, <laughs> but I think that's normal. Um, I hope that's normal. <laughs> and, you know, luckily I, I do, um, I mean, I'm really familiar with the uh, little Traverse community here. Um, you know, being in, from Michigan, especially in, our, in the Native community, he, you know, we move around a lot, not move, but we get around a lot. Um, we were a powwow family, so we traveled all through Michigan and surrounding states going to powwows every weekend and um, with a lot of like extended family from up here. So I felt super comfortable moving up here and, you know, experiencing a different life. And I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I wish that half of this wasn't in a pandemic because I've definitely like missed out on a lot of like the community stuff that I was really hoping to get. Um, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. I mean, it's, it's definitely has its challenges living. I mean, I'm 45 minutes away from a mire. So like that kind of adjusting, um, that was that that's always hard you know just like the convenience of living in the city as opposed to being out in the rural community but like also understanding you know we talk about like Detroit being a food desert but then I come up here and I'm in conversations up here about food access and they call this area food desert like why why is it a food desert <laughs> why don't we have access 
why do I have to go shop at a grocery store? But I'm in one of like the richest counties in Michigan, but I have to go and spend all this money <laughs> at a gas station and there's no fresh food there. What's going on here? <laughs> so, I mean, that's definitely opened my eyes. Um, and, you know, like living up here in the political clim climate that we've been in, that's a struggle. That's a little, that gets a little spicy. <laughs> Especially during election time. That was interesting. So my dad's family is from um, Wisconsin, from northern Wisconsin. And after they, after my dad and my grandmother passed away, um, we inherited their, the land that they had. Um, and on our reservation where, where our land is, it's also like butts up to our cousins and like other families. So that whole, our whole area is all family land. Um, and one of the things that I have been talking with, uh, with a couple cousins is, um, starting to tap our maple trees that are on our land. Um, so we'd really like to try to develop our own maple business, um, specifically for like my family there. Um, cause you know, I, my dad's been, my dad passed away in 2003. Um, and with that, like I was 21 when he passed away. So, um, you know, that definitely did some things to me <laughs> for sure. But, and, um, I kind of like pulled away from a lot of, um, a lot of my connection with culture and like my family over there, you know, because of grief and, you know, life getting in the way. And I live 12 hours away from my reservation. So it's, you know, it's just hard. Um, but I've been having a lot of like, a lot of, you know, dreams and thoughts about like doing something for, um, to bring that connection back. One of my favorite memories is um, working with the youth group down there. <laughs> They're all like, you know, angsty teenagers. And, you know, at the end of the school day, they have to go and to be at youth group and, you know, plant in the garden. And they're all, you know, crabby and don't want to participate. But at the end, they're like dancing around in the grass and <laughs> joking around and having a good time. And I'm like, yeah, it's the soil. <laughs> Like, it's okay to pull weeds. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> We've always had a garden growing up. Um, even if it was just like tomatoes and like peppers, we've always had something growing. Um, but it, the first year, so I was in the maternal infant home visiting program and then transitioned into sacred roots. Um, and that first year, doing that was the first time that we were like really in that I was involved in any of the planting and any of the planning that that went into that. Um, so we had like selected all of our seeds and planted corn. And from what I understood and maybe I'm wrong, but, um, that was the first time that we had grown corn out there and that it actually like grew and we had like more than like one tiny cob. Um, and it was amazing. Like <laughs> we were so excited. <laughs> and then the next year we grew glass gem corn and it was beautiful. And we like every cob that we like, you know, um, opened up was different and beautiful. And like, yeah, that was so powerful to me. I'm like, oh, I can't believe we did that. Like, cause you know, before that it had, a, had, you know, it was just like, like you, like my dad planting everything and us just like, you know, begrudgingly like pulling, you know, picking green beans for dinner, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the first time that like I had like done that and it was corn. I'd never grown corn before and it, it like came out good <laughs> and we cooked it and ate it and we didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. And then, you know, like being able to like have seeds to grow again next year and like with the intention of like, okay, so if we grow X amount of, you know, beans and corn and squash, then we'll be able to have this much for like our winter solstice, you know, celebration, which is cool. So 
I think, you know, across the board, I mean, there definitely has, I've definitely know people that, um, wouldn't even like think about eating wild rice or wouldn't even like think of like, you know, wanting to grow their own food. But because of what we've done and we, you know, show them all these, you know, that this it's attainable and it's easy, um, and you're supported by all this and it tastes good. (laughs) Um, I think like that, that's a huge, a huge thing. Um, cause I think you, there, a lot of folks have a mentality of like, well, that food's not for me, you know, eating like healthy, organic, you know, vegan or, but when I make the three sisters soup, I'm going to put turkey in it today, but normally it is vegan <laughs> when gluten-free. Um, and that's one of the things that I really like to show folks like, yeah, it still tastes good, but it doesn't have like any of like the terrible ingredients that we're used to. And it didn't come from a box. Um, so yeah. I am working on um, a three sister soup today. Um, and right now what I'm wor- what I'm what I've started on was um, processing the corn. So I grew um, a flint corn this past year. And if you are familiar with like tamales or tortillas or hominy, that is, a, those are products from flint corn. Um, you can see this here. So this is a flint corn. I can pull this one off. So um, we, I took, you know, this is what our finished product looks like after you pull it off the off the stock um, and this has been dried now for a while um, but what happens is you know this is a flint corn so you can't just eat it like a normal like sweet corn or yellow corn um, it's hard the point of all this is to get the the eye off like that so the corn looks like that so that's where the scrubbing motion comes in some folks will some folks grow like the white corn and I've noticed that that is a little easier to tell when the eyes come off or when it's yeah when when it's ready but with the colorful corn it's kind of hard to tell and sometimes some folks will spend a lot of time like going through and like literally picking (laughs) each corn's eye off (laughs) it has to be processed so this hull has to come off first before we can eat it um and one of the like funny jokes that native people have had (laughs) on um you know colonialists when you know when they were here trading we would trade corn or they would steal corn <laughs> and they would be like, this corn's making me sick. <laughs> it's not, I'm not digesting it. We can't digest this kind of corn. You have to break it down. You have to nixtamalize it. That's like the technical term. Um, and what we do with that is you boil it with, our people do um, use hardwood ash because um, it's the, the lye in the ash helps break down the hull. So, Um, This has been cooking now for a while. It's pretty much ready. I turned the heat off. Um, But this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see. But what will happen now is we'll, I'll rinse, I'll dump that pot and I'll rinse it and clean it really good. Um, Because you want to get all the ash off, all of that, all of that off before you use it. And then what happens after that, we can either dry it and save it um, for hominy or dry it and grind it down to a flour. And that's when you get masa for tortillas and, and tamales. Um, but today I'm just going to rinse it and clean it really good and then put it back into the soup. Um, in, in addition, I will put, this is our Gateo Kosaman squash that I dehydrated earlier in the season. Um, this squash, I'm like emotionally attached to the squash. I don't know if you can ever be emotionally attached to squash, but I am. (laughs) Um, I've been growing this squash, 
um, since I was in Detroit. Um, and we were gifted just a really small handful of seeds that hadn't been grown in however long. Um, so I think we had maybe like 10 seeds and we like grew six. Um, and like, you know, plants came up and it was great. But um, one of the things that happens with squash is sometimes you get squash vine borer bugs. Um, and that happened to that squash back then. I think this was in like 2017. So I like, you know, had a moment of freak out because I'm like, oh, my squash is going to die. I'm not going to have any squash this season. It's terrible. Um, but I Googled how you can save a plant and it's pretty disgusting, but we, you have to, you know, find on the vine where they got in and like pull it out. It was pretty gross, but we were able to save some and we, <laughs> we like got a few different, you know, a few, maybe, maybe four or five um, squash and one grew like super big. Um, and we carried it around like a baby. So we've been growing that squash ever since. <laughs> um, so I'm emotionally attached to the squash sister for sure. Um, and then these two beans, um, this is Odawa bean. So this is, um, specific to this area. And these are going to go in first cause they're going to cook the longest. So I put onions and garlic, but I also added um, sage and ramp powder or ramp salt um, or leek salt. And those are the wild, the wild leeks that grow out here. And just a, a bit of olive oil. I did a lot of cooking when at when I worked in Detroit, because um, a lot of our, all of our programming, you had to feed folks. That was the only way that you can get them to come. <laughs> yeah, that's really where all of my oops, all of my food experience comes from is just providing community meals, whether it's for a handful of people or three, four hundred people. We used to do um, solstice celebrations. Um, winter solstice celebrations um, every year and quickly got thrown on that committee <laughs> uh, which is what like really honestly one of my like favorite things um, favorite memories is cooking for like three you know three four hundred people and then Everyone's like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> or I haven't had this food in so long, or I've never had this before, and I was always afraid to eat this way. I mean, solstice is a time that, you know, we come together to, you know, prepare for the winter and share, you know, share our resources. You know, it looks a little different now, but, um, but it's still very much a part of like, you know, our normal practice, what we do. Um, and then these are Chippewa beans and I'm Chippewa. I'm not, I'm not Odawa. So I felt really strongly to grow a Chippewa bean. Um, and this, I've never tasted these before, but the Odawa beans are really buttery and delicious. So I thought I'd throw those in there too. And then, um, I have a wild rice pudding here too, which is um, most folks eat wild rice as a savory dish, um, but we do a sweet dish with this. And we, I've kind of been playing with my own little recipe, um, but I'll put, I put maple cream in here and then some folks mix like strawberries and blueberries, but I just have strawberries today. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I definitely think, you know, this food sovereignty movement, whether you're an indigenous person or not, it's super sexy right now. Um, but, <laughs> you
you know, let's let's keep it sexy like forever. <laughs> um, I don't want it to the, just be a trend, you know. Um, I think what we've learned, especially in these last three three years, I'll say three, um, is that we have to be self sufficient. We have to um, be able to be sustainable. Um, and we have to know how to grow our own food <laughs> if we're going to survive. Um, and I think that, I mean, I wholeheartedly believe that our growth um, as Native people is because of the work that continues to happen specifically around these foods. Um, you know, again, we were we were removed from so much of our livelihood and we're now in a generation where we're trying to get that back. Um, and my wish um, for like the next generations, especially my children and their children, I don't want my great great grandkids to have to revitalize our food ways. <laughs> like I want them to know everything. Um, and I think that it's, you know, it's up to, it's up to our youth right now. It's up to these next generations. I'm 40. <laughs> I'm doing the work, but <laughs> some of y'all are, are coming in <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's not easy work and, but it's not meant to be easy. And I think that's one of the struggles that we have is that we want things easy and we want things quick right now. And, Farming is just not easy and quick. <laughs> it's a long process. Um, but if we look at our food system, and again, that's what food sovereignty means is, um, you know, understanding your role in this food system and determining how this works for you rather, rather than the other way around. <laughs> how do you fit into the food system? You know, how to how is the food system going to work for me?